chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Granddaddy by C.J. Canatelli Performed by Otis Gyre I guess you can say I was stupid or perhaps even naive. I'm a 22-year-old woman. I live in the most remote region of Montana. I'm a city girl at heart, but the only life I've known is deep in the country. My parents died when I was young in a car accident that was too far away from civilization for any emergency personnel to arrive in time to save them. At first they were missing. Days later they were found dead. It doesn't affect me much, I was only two at the time, and staying with my granddaddy. He worked as a mechanic at a local shop. He never got a lot of business, but all the locals went to him for their every vehicular need. Granddaddy taught me the value of hard work, elbow grease, and how to take care of a car before I was even old enough to drive one. I was driving down United States Highway 2. For those of you unfamiliar with my surroundings, it's notorious in all those big city magazines as the most dangerous highway in America. I guess I never thought much about that, seeing as I'd been driving up and down that long stretch of road since I got my license. For many years, I'd driven through the great state of Montana on that deserted path. Sure, it's a highway, all right, but if you're there for too long or if you go too far, slowly but surely all your fellow drivers seem to vanish. The further you get from home the less people you come across. I'm a country girl, even though Granddaddy always told me I'd grow up to be a city girl like my mama. Mama was a movie star. Well, that's what Granddaddy always tells me. Really, she lived for a few years up in California. Granddaddy always makes those years of my mama's life sound so glamorous, but Aunt Suzanne got drunk at a family barbecue and said Mama was a streetwalker hoping to find some fat cat to give her a big break up in the Berkeley Hills. Granddaddy slapped his daughter, my Aunt Suzanne, right across her face. In all my years, I've never seen my granddaddy get angry. Hell, from the looks of all my kin, I'd wager not one of them at the picnic table ever saw Granddaddy angry. From that moment, all along through the rest of the night, not one person had the audacity to say a damn word. It was the quietest barbecue in all my life. Only time I'd ever heard anything so quiet was on a hunting trip with Granddaddy when I was a kid. Those deep, dark woods got real quiet right before we saw a coyote strut right on past our newly pitched tent. Granddaddy warned me that when nature gets quiet, shit's about to go wild and you better keep your trap shut if you don't want to end up as dead as a doornail. That's what happened at that barbecue, and I'd swear on a stack of holy Bibles that nobody in my family ever crossed Granddaddy again. Nobody spoke about my mother ever again, and if they did, the words were kind. Never speak ill of the dead in front of a holy man like Granddaddy. Granddaddy is a soft-spoken, plump old-timer who always has a can of Pap's Blue Ribbon in his hand and a fat lump of chewing tobacco in his mouth. Once he got home from the shop, he'd spend all the twilight hours on his rocker out on the wraparound porch. He'd drink a six-pack and spit his tobacco in that old gray bucket that I don't believe he ever emptied in my whole life. It smelled sometimes, but that scent was the smell of home. Every Sunday, Granddaddy would wake up at the crack of dawn to drive his red pickup out to the pond a couple miles away, He'd bring bird seed and feed all the ducks while reading a Sunday paper. He'd make it back home by seven in the morning, and I learned young I'd damn well better be dressed and ready for Sunday service when he got home. If I slept late, Granddaddy wouldn't wait for me. He'd drive his pickup into town and leave my ass to walk four miles in my Sunday dress. I never tested what he would do if I didn't make it to church. Granddaddy was a man nobody 
ever wants to cross. So, Granddaddy is why I was out in the middle of nowhere up on Highway 2 late that night. I'd been away from home doing my studies in agriculture. Every month, I'd travel up that long, barren road and visit Granddaddy for the weekend. The drive took hours, and I always got to the house at half past three in the morning. No matter what time I'd make it home, Granddaddy'd be rocking in his chair on the porch. I had a feeling he'd stay up all night making sure I got in safely. He'd always have a mug of black coffee and a warm smile. He'd always take my luggage from me, and when I told him I could manage, Granddaddy said a real man always gets the bags for the lady. All my life, Granddaddy respected women, and he taught me that I deserved a good, fair treatment. Chivalry ain't dead. Y'all just aren't looking at gentlemen like my Granddaddy. I'd pour myself a cup of his freshly brewed local store brand coffee, sit out on the porch with him, and watch the sunrise. That night, I was really looking forward to that cup of caffeinated goodness. My eyes were heavy, and I knew I only had about an hour and a half left to go. I felt like if I could just close my eyes for a couple of minutes, I'd make it to the house by four in the morning. I knew there was a little rest stop coming up in a few miles. Well, let me be clear. It was a Highway 2 rest stop, and it wasn't close to much of anything at all. No bathrooms, no food, and nothing but a six-car parking lot. Never had I heard about anybody stopping at those lots, let alone in the middle of the night. I'm going to stress this again. I'm a wannabe city girl, but in my heart and soul I was raised country. Stranger danger didn't exist in my world because our tiny town was an everybody-knows-everybody kind of place. Either way, I hadn't seen another car in hours, and I figured it couldn't hurt anything to stop for twenty minutes. I pulled into the lot and turned off my engine on my old beat-up minivan. I chucked the locks on the doors and chuckled to myself. There wasn't a living soul out in these parts for miles. I'd be fine to rest. I closed my eyes and think I might have begun to have a dream about this boy, Roger Connolly, the cute boy who worked one of the two registers at the local mart. Suddenly, a loud crash shook me from my slumber, and I screamed loudly. Glass covered me from head to my old canvas sneakers. My window had been busted in, but, oh, I had bigger problems than that. A big, strong hand was grabbing my throat, digging ragged fingernails into my skin. I gasped for air, flailed around for dear life. It was a big man wearing a flannel button-up and a baseball cap. I couldn't see his face, and I didn't want to see his face. My memory flashed back to the thoughts I had been consumed with while still on the road. I remembered Granddaddy slapping Aunt Suzanne right upside her crooked lipstick. He didn't say a word to her. He came to my side and patted me on the shoulder. When you're in a pinch, little girl, you either man up or get out. Sure, Granddaddy had been talking about defending his dead daughter and telling Aunt Suzanne to take a long hike off a short pier, but something in my brain clicked, and I realized I couldn't man up, so I had to get the hell out of there. I reached for the keys and started the engine. Before the man could stop me, I threw that shift into drive and sped off, my head slamming back up against the ripped leather headrest as the force of the man's grip was yanked from my neck. With a busted window this time of year, the ride home wouldn't be pleasant, but that was the least of my worries. I checked the rearview mirrors and realized the man was fading into the distance. He'd hopped into a shitbox sedan and took off going the opposite direction. Through my tears, I giggled softly to myself, remembering what Granddaddy said after he gave me a good talking to for not speaking up when I saw Linda Beller steal a pack of Hubba Bubba from the local mart. I'd waited until we got back to the car to tell Granddaddy what I'd seen. He turned the car off and looked me in the eye like he always did when I was in trouble. Bad people do bad things, but if you let them get away with it, not only are you bad, but you're a coward. 
No grandbaby of mine is a coward. You go in there and pay with your allowance for what you just did. Tom owns this shop, and he's a hard-working man. You kept your mouth shut. Now you gotta pay up. Bad people do bad things. The man who attacked me was a bad person. But this time, instead of paying the price after the fact, Granddaddy's lesson taught me I had better not grow up to be a coward. As I cried, I realized how proud my granddaddy would be. He always worried so much, and I could finally tell him I got myself out of trouble and I wasn't a coward, just like he taught me. Pulling into the long driveway at around four in the morning, I saw Granddaddy sitting on his rocker. He wore a blue dress shirt and faded gray slacks that I recognized as his Sunday service clothes. I rushed out of the car, sobbing loudly as I ran up to him. For the first time in all my years, Granddaddy didn't wait up for me. If he was awake, he'd be off his ass and grabbing his rifle, seeing my window smashed in and all that. Not wanting to wake him up to bad news, I carried my luggage up to my room without Granddaddy. As I tossed the bag on the bed, I realized this wasn't right. Granddaddy never let me carry my luggage, and he was always wide-eyed and bushy-tailed when I made my way home once a month. I ran out to the porch, screen door slamming loudly behind me. Granddaddy didn't even stir. Fearing the worst, I reached out and touched him. His hand. It was cold as ice and dead as a doornail. His coffee was still warm, resting on the table beside him next to his chewing tobacco. Granddaddy, I said, salty tears in my eyes. I sighed and sat next to him, shaking my head. Just like a man. Just like a fucking man. I didn't call up the sheriff just yet. I wanted to sit there for one last sunrise with my granddaddy. I drank his coffee, and for the first time in my young life, chewed his tobacco as the sun rose over the horizon. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights